see your face and to talk again. I know, I know. Um, uh, we'll we'll jump into things, but I, you know, I just wanted to say that it's funny because I remember I I hit you up. I was bugging the shit out of you about something, <laughs> and I was like, when when you're putting some music out, and you said <laughs> I have something coming in January, and then you like I don't know, you're a little secretive about it, so. So here we are talking about what that uh, what that secret was. Here we are. I mean, not really a secret, more of a, am I really going to put this out? <laughs> 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 um, Did you really think that way? You know, I think that this project was the first time, I think, in my entire life that there was no expectation put on the release of a body of work, like personal work, artist work. Um, mm. You know, when I was doing White Sea, it, it was always kind of, you know, you have to remember it's on the heels of, you know, headlining the Hollywood Bowl with my last performance with M83. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, starting from scratch was uh, uh, very humbling. And um, frankly, probably the best thing that happened because I don't know at the time and I don't know now that uh just being on tour and putting out records is enough to feed my brain hmm. personally yeah. Yeah. um I wanted to make music in lots of different ways and I I just um I was really fortunate you know I kind of stepped in shit if you will um with composition and doing bang gang yeah and I and it was a pivot it was a giant pivot for me because I I you know we got to feed ourselves and uh, I think M83 and the success we had with Hurry Up We're Dreaming, you know, uh, kind of offset before by Saturdays Equals Youth. It was it was a moment in time. It was a moment in indie music. It was also one of the last times I think that a band could really make good money, like without yeah. having a hit single. <laughs> yeah. And, Even though the and, night was huge, it wasn't sure. on Billboard Top 10. And it wasn't like, you know, on pop radio, you know, which is well, really and even if it had been, I mean, if you had if you had hitched everything in your wagon to that one star, uh, you know, now just sort of looking back and seeing the, I guess, the trajectory of M83, you wouldn't be working all the time. I mean, it, like if you if, if you look no. at that gap now, I mean, yeah. you know, well, it's, also, it's also like worth being very honest about what the situation was. You know, at the end of the day, it wasn't my fucking band. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't my band. And even though I participated on every front from touring to writing, songwriting, to singing, yeah. to you know, additional production, whatever it was, it was never my project. So even though, you know, anyone that's been to the show back in the day, which is like 10 years ago now, which is just insane, <laughs> um, knows perfectly well that, you know, Anthony really shared the stage with myself, with Jordan as well, the bass player. You know, it was very, it wasn't like a one man show up there. It was a collective, it was a band. But uh, ethos wise, it may have been so, but um, on paper, it wasn't. And yeah. I, I don't know. I just, you know, I could sense that things were coming to an end after that record. It was kind of the end of an era. And, um, and you were right. And I was right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, uh, we mutually parted and, um, you know, he's my family. I love him to death. Uh, but he wanted to go in a different direction. And I kind of knew that there wasn't really like a space for me to thrive anymore within that situation. It would have been back to exactly where you had left off. You would have been on the road performing that well, and more also than at the whim of, a, of another human being. Yeah. And I wanted agency. And, and did you... Do you like distinctly feel like you outgrew that? Like one, once, 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 once you were, once you'd left M83, there was no looking back, right? I mean, I, I know that there yeah. was like some vague stuff up in the air. Like we talked about this last I mean, time. Yeah, well, like sometimes talk about, you know, it's like, sure. you know, it's a, we, we, it's, it's rare, but we do connect with music even in regards to M83 sometimes. Um, yeah. I have no doubt there'll probably be a moment at some point where we come back together and do something. You know, that's just the nature of having a great collaboration with people, but you need to kind of go and grow on your own. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, and on his latest tour, he didn't hit you up and say, I got a spot. I need a, I need keyboard girl again. No. No, no. But the messages on Instagram have been nice. You know, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, feels, it feels nice to be remembered now and then. Yeah. 
um, because it was such a formative part of my life. But I digress because I don't want to talk about MA3 too much. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, know, then I, let's let's just we, we can just jump right ahead because I've got a, I've got a, a lot of questions. OK, um, great. Awesome. So uh, I guess, geez, where, where do I even start? Um, I'm going to I'm going to be nonlinear with this because I, you know, I, I looked I, it, my limited research. Um, you know, I, I I saw who you worked with on this album. Uh, you know, Butch Walker and Jake Sinclair, and I guess Kevin Devine had one co-write on it. But yeah. of course, like for me, and I think that one thing that we share is this like deep, weird love of Butch Walker. Like, you know, <laughs> everybody Walk, says Walker. that. <laughs> he's just, you know, I mean, music aside, he's just he, there's just something about him that is, uh, you know, like it's it's this weird combination of like really down to earth and yet like. Oh, fucking he's, superstar! You know, my it's fucking brother from another. I will cut tires for that man. Like, <laughs> and it's funny because we had always been, you know, we've known each other for a long time socially, especially because we share the same management, ah. and um, that's kind of how this came about. Is I sent, you know, I sent this idea, this nascent idea, to my manager Jonathan Daniel, who's been managing Butch, by the way, from the very get. Mm. So, um. You know, I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to produce this on my own. I have a vision for it. I know what it looks like and feels like, and I want to step outside of this. I just don't want to make electronic music anymore. <laughs> I want to, I want to sing. I want to write songs. I want to be a storyteller again. I want to like lean into the, the, the craft of songwriting. And yeah. um, he was like, you know, I hate to say it, but I think Butch might be the perfect person. I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's try it. <laughs> And he, we he, just, I mean, you know, we just totally reconnected because, you know, he had moved to Nashville outside of Nashville at that point. Um, and this was during the pandemic and it was so joyous. And my God, it was like, it was like one of those moments where you're like, how have we never made a record together? Because <laughs> we are so good as collaborators. It's crazy fast, crazy intuitive. We are so different and so similar. It's like, yeah. it's like the perfect mixture because he's just... He's a savant, you know, he's, he's brilliant. Yeah. He does. Well, it's, it's funny because, um, I was listening to like love line. Yeah. If you weren't singing on it, I'd be like, Oh, this is a Butch Walker song. Like there's something about the sort of the humor and the story and ironically uh, nothing to do with him. That's really the thing. There, yes, th th this, this, yes, this is where, where, where your connection together, is. But I remember we were kind of like three quarters of the way through the record and I was living out in the desert in my parents' guest house because my life had just fallen to shit. And um, I was on my way to Joshua Tree to see a very dear friend of mine. And I was on that kind of windy road that goes up into Joshua Tree. And I I was like, this mel this idea came into my head. I was like, Arr! and I just pulled over and I sent Butch a voice note. And I was like, dude, I think we need an Elton John like kitsch moment mm. on this record. I want to do something that's not so heavy because, you know, when you listen to the lyrics on this record, it's pretty intense and vulnerable and frankly, yeah. incredibly intimate. So I was like, why don't we why don't we like lean into the storytelling and just have some fun? And I was like, and a sex hotline seems like the best way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I said from that, he was like, fuck, yeah, I'm on board. And uh, yes, of course, it was a co-write, but uh but I think that was also like the osmosis of working with someone who gave me the freedom to explore things I hadn't been able to explore in other genres of music before. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, it's just, it was, I, I think that, that, that the correlation there is like, it's some of Butch's songs are super narrative. Like you could take the music out and, you, and yeah. it, it would just be a short story or something like that. And that, and that, that was sort of something that, that I, I detected in love line. And I, I love that. I, I love the angle for, and, and by the way, Glenn is, a very sexy name. <laughs> well, you know, I started calling him that. Oh, cause really? Because I, I was like, Butch, what's your fucking real name, bro? <laughs> is, is, is it like, Brad? Well, it, it's Brad. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I don't like that. What's your middle name? He's like, Glenn. I was like, uh, Glenn. There we go. I'm going to start calling you Glenn. That's nice. better. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, inter it was an interesting, because I don't know if you know, but I, I basically co-wrote on his record that he put out because he no. wrote he wrote the glenn record yeah we made sue oh like okay a year later or whatever all right um, well, we're jumping way ahead and we'll get back to a more linear thing but yes but finish um but i i helped him on all the lyrics on that record except for one 
Oh, oh, that that's that's super interesting. Okay, so when did you start writing um rookie? Or I guess what would be rookie? I guess you know, there's a there's a couple songs that had been kicking around for a long time. Extraordinary Life was one of them. You know, Jake Jake Sinclair is there's a very special magic when we write together. Um he he hears things the way that I can't express and I articulate the ideas that inspire that that in mm -hmm. him so it's a very like amazing exchange so extraordinary life was something that had been lying around frankly for over god 12 years like the lyric and we had written the song maybe five years ago I mean it, it had been around for a long time and it and just didn't fit into a sort of white sea no, I mean, not really, because it just, yeah. it, 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 you know, White Sea is based in electronic music at its core, and it just didn't feel like it was honoring what the song was to go there with it. Okay. So it was just kind of there. I knew it was, I loved that song, but I didn't quite know what to do with it. The rest of it, we, um, it just kind of flowed so quickly. I mean, Butch and I wrote that record, and, and obviously, you know, the middle of the record is Jake and I. The beginning of the record and the end of the record are are Butch and I, and then obviously Desert Caviar is with Kevin, who is yeah. one of, one of my oldest collaborators and dearest friends. I've obviously yeah. I remember him. last time we spoke, you mentioned him. Yeah, and I just think that Kevin has a thoughtfulness, a wit, a sharpness, um, unrivaled. Like one of the smartest human beings that I know. And when you listen to his lyrics and his music, which I've had the pleasure of, you know, performing with him and singing on with him on various tours just because I want to hang with him and make music um it, it, I just knew he had to be on the record and that's kind of the song that we that we landed on yeah 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 I see um who else uh who else performed on the album who, who were the other personnel on the album the main collaborator was um Mark Stepro on drums which he does everything with Butch and he, yeah he also played in White Sea he's amazing he's oh. one of the best 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 drummers ever yeah um, and so it was a no-brainer that he did the session the two-day session with us to record the record because we recorded in basically less than 48 hours which is kind of crazy then was that um, at butch's studio yes yeah mm -hmm. yeah and then um obviously the incomparable rob moose who uh i knew i i've always wanted to work with him and uh, I hit him up to do strings on on the record and uh, just told him to go to town because it's it's one of those rare situations where I know that taste level wise, it's like so on the, the level. And actually, because of Rookie, I ended up working with him on Mothering Sunday. I asked him to come and collaborate with me on Mothering, the score for Mothering Sunday. So oh, wow. an exceptional, exceptional brain, exceptional creative. Yeah. So when when was was that that two day recording session? When when did that happen? Oh God! It was in the spring of twenty twenty one. Okay. And then we finished it. We shot photos maybe a couple months later because the visual part of storytelling to me is like essential. I'm come from the very Bjork mentality with that. We've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was just you know. But to be honest with you, and I've, I've been in a really rough patch of life. And um, did you want to talk about that or no? No, I mean, it's it's easy to say, you know, my partnership with my with my ex partner, it ended and he's my mm -hmm. best friend and a soulmate. And it was um, it's still very painful, yeah. um, especially as a woman approaching her 40s. You know, I don't think that um, that swath of women are spoken to at all. And it annoys yeah. me. Yep. <laughs> so you know i and i think that sue was a moment you know i was in the desert getting drunk every day and swimming in the pool and taking walks and just so alone with my thoughts for the first time in a really long time and um it just felt like a jewel box and i wanted to keep it i wanted to honor it and do it justice by putting it out properly because i feel like everything i've done with white sea in the past has been like a a frantic, ah, 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 put it up, man. yeah, yeah, and it's a desire for content. I was like, yeah. let's do this, no expectations, so I might as well just do it the way that I want to, and that's why I sat on it for so long. I see. Um, so, because I, I, you know, one of the questions, and I, and I'm sure 
you're going to be asked this. You have been and you continue to be asked this. Like where, you know, how much of the of the Sue Clayton character is you? How much of her story is yours? I mean, it seems obviously like there's I mean, it's, a fair bit. It's obviously me. I mean, you yeah. Know. There's no denying it, but, um, but it's, you know, but don't forget too, that while there are moments of intense personal uh, expression, Helicopters is one of those songs, um, which I wrote for my ex-partner Craig, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot of it is, um, it's sentiment through the lens of storytelling. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's like, it's like, um true events that have been dramatized for the screen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's like, that's what, this, that's what this record feels like. But at the end of the day, like would I waltz around drinking tequila, looking fabulous all day. Yes, please. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's definitely me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interested by what, what you said before about how sort of like building the visual was like a, a key component in the whole thing. And um, Samantha's Samantha West photography is absolutely beautiful. And I know you've worked with her in the past. Um, yeah. Can you want, can you like sort of speak to that a little bit? I mean, there's, there's, there's some pastiche that, you know, has certain looks, but like, how, how do you think that, that, that like, let's just call it the lookbook informed the, the music. It's a very cool story actually, because Samantha, First of all, she's one of the most brilliant creatives that I know and have the pleasure of working with for 10 years now. She's the only one that shoots me. I don't really yeah. shoot with anybody else. Um, I get to be myself. I feel comfortable. You know, being in front of the camera is not my MO. So um few people. Uh yeah, right. Uh so she had found a photo album, I think on the East Coast, in like a a weird little pawn shop or you know vintage place or whatever yeah and it was this 1970s album where this man was so in love with his wife that he ha- it was only photos of her oh. and it's fucking heartbreaking to think yeah. that this album they probably had no children mm-hmm. it never or their grandchildren gave it away who the hell knows what happened but the mythology of this this voyeurism uh, into the very private life of this woman. I mean, you. I, the first time I looked at this album, I was just like, I was crying. It was just really, really moving. And I was like, this is what we, this is, this is, this is the story of the visuals. Like we need to recreate, you know, that's why some of the teaser videos feel very like um, eight millimeter kind of yeah. wedding, like a man documenting his wife, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, <clears throat> So that was kind of the basis for our inspiration. And then I found this glorious house out in Palm Springs um, that's trapped in amber from mm. the 60s and 70s. And I was like, okay, this is where we shoot. And yeah. um, and so we just, we had a six hour day and just shot as much as possible and just rushing around. I mean, it was like 110 degrees. I was sweating my ass off, you know, it was, it was such a fun day, but it was, but it's really kind of like um, the progression of a woman that starts off very hopeful and then slowly but surely finds herself and ends up, I think, very messy and mm. very lost and also kind of shaking hands with the future and saying like, okay, what's next? So that's kind of the idea. Do you, do you think that that's a happy ending or is it just an I ending? I think it's a real ending. I don't think there are any happy endings. I think that, you know, a story never ends. So it's always a story is always developing yeah. people's lives are always developing. You know, it's not, um, it's not, nothing is linear. Um, so yeah, I think it gets happy again. I think it probably gets sad again and then it gets mm-hmm. happy again. And, um, you know, speaking for myself, the lonelier moments, the, the harder moments become more manageable as you get older. And that's if you're doing the kind of work that, engenders a sense of consciousness about the way you're walking through your life i'm yeah. hoping that for sue hoping that for myself you know <laughs> and do you uh, this is maybe a question you can't answer but like do you envision sue clayton albums to come in the future and if so would she continue to sort of be a parallel of you or do you think that you would write the story off into a different direction i mean i guess you have that freedom if you so choose but i wonder what you think about that That's a good question um 
I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think it'll obviously, you know, the weird thing about using Sue as a skin, if you will, mm-hmm. is yeah. that she allows me to actually be more vulnerable because sure. there's a fourth wall, you know, yeah. so- it ain't you, it's her. Exactly. And it kind of is her, you know, I mean, it, like I said, it's dramatized. It's, it's yeah. um, um, but it's also very tender. It's very personal. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, the more um, slice of life moments on the record are they're from my life, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think I was in such a vulnerable place writing this record. I don't know that it would be the same, but I don't know. It remains to be seen. I'm not sure. I don't know yet. Okay. I would love to keep writing music for Sue, though, because I think that, you know, what if she, um, <clears throat> you know, moves to Detroit and starts making house music? I don't know. <laughs> you, and it's that, that's funny. You could always just use it as that, right? She's <laughs> she's the, the ultimate excuse. She's a, a scapegoat, yeah. or uh, or she's she's your muse, whatever whatever the hell you want, right? Well, yeah. And I think that that's why composition is so great for me is that it gives me a glass ceiling to bump up against. And I think that Sue has finally been a costume that I can put on that allows me to feel infinitely more free writing for myself without judging what it is, Mm -hmm. just letting it be um, a, a reflection of a moment in time. So, yeah. And as a composer, um, how much of the sort of composer sense, eyes, ears, whatever you want to call it, did you bring consciously to Rookie? Hmm. I can't say. I can't say that I brought necessarily any particular technical skills to making Rookie from composition, but I will say that having stepped away from songwriting for about seven years, really outside of working with panic um, and a couple of others. um, There was just a groundedness in knowing what worked and what didn't, Mm -hmm. because those are the decisions that I have to make every day when I'm composing, I have to make executive decisions and not him and ha about what's right and and what's wrong. You know, I don't indulge myself in that way because I'm working on deadlines when I'm composing. So I think, I think the ability to make decisions is, is really what was um, fully brought over to, to making the, the, the rookie record. Gotcha. Um, You probably know I'm going to ask, but what's what's up is anything up with white c and because the interesting thing is like i'm wondering now that i know more about about sue and about rookie i can see you know how she came to be but i like i wonder what you think Mm -hmm. of white c in that sense like is white c you like that that was that was sort of this this like stupid question i had it's like okay well you have sue do you have white c and is white c different from morgan I think White Sea was an exploration. I think White Sea is, it it provided the same moniker cloak idea um, that Sue has, but it was me, you know, I'm a late bloomer. Like I wasn't one of those artists out the gate that understood how to be cool and play the game and do whatever. Yeah. So I, I'm at peace with that. Um, my work gets better as I get older and I'm really proud of that. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I never thought that anyone gave a shit about White Sea. It always felt like a failure to me. And it felt like a failure because I didn't know what it was. Hmm. I was experimenting with different songwriting and different genres. And, you know, I mean, yes, there's a cohesive thread, but White Sea for me is very formative exploration years. And um, I think if I were to come back to it, uh, I think it would be really strong, but I, it would have to be way more specific. And I'm not sure I know what that is yet. So hmm. interesting. Yeah. I mean, cause you know what? Yeah. One thing that we, we talked about last time is that, you know, cause I was like, I, I just want to, I just want to see a white sea concert, damn it. And oh, understanding that, that there's, you know, a lot of things would have to happen. 
for that yeah, to just never did anything i mean let's be fucking honest like you know well, what am i gonna that's do dumb. that's played, dumb played a fucking club with five people in it and no you, you said the same thing you you said you you don't you don't want to be on stage performing to 40 people no, and i and i get not, that and you shouldn't it's you... fucking miserable it's miserable. Oh, yes i know yes i make yeah. music for myself first and foremost that's what i love about sue it's the first time that i made music for myself and that's why i sat on it for so long hmm but I don't make music only for me. I make it to share it because the exchange with an audience is where it comes alive. And it, 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 it explores nuances that the record, you know, is not going to do in a live yeah. setting. Um, so <sighs> it's just, look, would I love to be on stage in any capacity? Absolutely. Do I think that the past White Sea stuff merits that? Man. Do I think that Sue does? Absolutely. I think it would be a brilliant show. Yeah. And do I hope that I can come back to White Sea at some point and it somehow has some relevancy? Sure. But it's hard. It is hard for artists. Oh, no doubt. I do oh, not you... envy new artists. Like the the way that people have to creatively gymnastics their way into even like creating space for themselves i'm too old i'm tired i don't want to do that it's not yeah. satisfying to me you're not so, you're not you're not you're not dreaming of, of of a a bus much less a van tour you know for fuck no no one side of the tour. year no more yeah. van tours an autobiography um <laughs> yeah no it's not happening yeah um you know, if there was a reason to do some regional stuff and it felt like the train had left the station a little bit, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you never know. You know, you kind of have to, like, feel things out. Sue is so new that th there might be an opportunity to do some stuff with her. I, I hope so. But with White Sea, um, you know, that basically the last tour I did was with White Sea and it was opening up for Naked and Famous on a B Market tour. Yeah. I was so depressed by that experience. That was where the moment where I was like, fuck I this. fuck this. This is a waste of my brain capacity. This mm -hmm. is a waste of time, money, resources, other people's time, the feeling of letting people down. And we just don't, I'm, I'm not in a phase in my life anymore where building things grassroots that way, where you do those van tours is like remotely interesting to me or, yeah. um, or accessible, frankly. So, yeah. And I mean, I, I don't know if, if like, do those even work and maybe they're just done different by people in their twenties, but I wouldn't be able to tell anyone how, I mean, not that I would know, but like, do, how does it work? I don't know. You know? I think that maybe just saying, fuck it, I'm just going to do anything and everything. And if that means well, driving around. But that is your 20s. Yeah. Your 20s is a season of yes. No one should be saying no to anything in mm -hmm. their 20s. I mean, I think within reason, obviously, like sure. I don't mean to, you know, to take that with a grain of salt, but um, I'm not in a season of yes anymore in my life. Yeah. I get way. that. I get that. And I've earned that. I yes. fucking earned that. And um, I am now exploring how to connect even with this record in a way that feels authentic to where I am in my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm in the process of discovering what that is. And that's really exciting to me because, you know, your reality is whatever you choose to make of it, I suppose. Sure. And, um, uh, you know, we shall see. We shall see what happens. I'm, I mean, look, I'm, I'm hopeful to, I'm not being like completely nihilistic or pessimistic about it, but I'm, I am a pragmatist and um, there's no reason to go on the road unless there's a reason to go on the road. A hundred percent. And also, I mean, you, do you sort of view it as you have a day job and then, you know, Sue is maybe your nighttime job? Um. No, I think they're holistic. I think they mm -hmm. feed each other. They feed my creativity and my muscles, my creative muscles in a very specific way. And I, they're necessary. It's necessary yeah. for me to do both. Um, it's all a job at the end of the day. Yeah. And the moments where you get to have just pure joy in making music when it has, it's like any passion that becomes a career it does end up feeling like a job sometimes it's inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So, so yes, is this my job? Absolutely. Composing is my job. Making music in general is my job. Mm -hmm. And I'm in a phase of my life where I'm seeking out opportunities to, to, to reignite a sense of um, childlike wonder and joy with moments of making music with other people and for other projects and for myself. And that's something that I really want to connect to again. So awesome. That's great. Um, so before we go, I do, I do want to touch on the work that you did uh, on the power. Awesome pieces. I was I was just I was just running through a, a bunch of them before we jumped on the call. One thing that I noticed, and I've only listened to like little bits of your other composition work for TV and film. Was this the first time that you really started incorporating what I assume to be is your own voice as an instrument in your compositions? It's not the first time, but it's the biggest time. And yeah. um, I did it previously on a project last year called Am I Being Unreasonable, which actually just won a couple of BAFTAs two nights ago, which I'm very proud of my team. Congrats. Um, thank you. Uh, that was such a joy. It's a dark, dark comedy. It's actually on Hulu and it's brilliant. It's a brilliant show. Um, very proud to be a part of that. So that was kind of the first time that I really went there. But it's that was a dark comedy, so it's very different. This this it was very clear that the palette of the power was exactly like my bread and butter since yeah. orchestra vocals. Yeah. Um, and so I really leaned into that and it was uh, uh it was such a joy. It was such yeah. a joy to work on. I'm really proud of the score. Sounded great. Thank you. So what what do you have going on right now? Are I like are are you, you're obviously doing like, I guess, like album cycle promo for Rookie. Uh, what else do you have going on? Um, I'm wrapping up a couple of other TV shows right now. Um, and uh, I've got three things going on right now, which I'm excited to be done with, even though I love them. Uh, it's been a long time since I've had a moment to step back and reassess. So I'm going to be taking a little a little breath, I think this summer and just thinking about what's next. And then I jump into a couple TV shows in the fall. So. Gotcha. All right. Well, you know, again, congrats on rookie. It's, I mean, whatever you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of your work and uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll always be one making noise about you. So whatever you put out, I mean, I, it's, it's a four before I've heard it. So the second I hear the first note, that's definitely jumping towards <laughs> six or seven. By the end of the song, everything you put out is probably going to be an eight or a nine. So I'm glad that we finally got uh, some more from you. And thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank even you. though you're, you're welcome, even though you don't have any plans, whatever comes up next, I'll be looking forward to. Thanks, Aaron. Well, it was really good to talk to you again. And I hope you've been really well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to catch up another time. And if, if you're if you're back for the film festival anytime, um, you, 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 we, we have to get together. So I, would I, I absolutely love that. Cocktails, here we come. Exactly. All right. Great, <laughs> great to chat with you. You too. All the best. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.